Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm George Thomas. Today, as the Biden administration gives Iran six billion dollars for five Americans, growing concerns about Iran backing terrorist activity against Israel and its nuclear program. Will Israel actually launch a military strike? The first de debate among Republican presidential candidates happens tonight, but without frontrunner Donald Trump. So how will his absence affect the rest of the field? Former ESPN anchor Sage Steele speaking out on protecting women's sports from a transgender agenda. And one of America's most well-known actors, Dennis Quaid, releasing a new record called Fallen, gospel record for sinners. Those stories and much more today on Newswatch. This is CBN Newswatch. Uh, hello, everyone. We begin, though, in the Middle East, where amid concerns over Iran's nuclear program, the recent deal between the United States and Iran to release U.S. citizens has been called the highest ransom ever paid for American hostages. As my colleague Julie Stahl reports from Jerusalem, in exchange for five American detainees, Iran will get $6 billion in frozen assets. Take a look. The U.S. State Department maintains those assets held in South Korea can only be used for humanitarian purposes, and Iran will still be held accountable for human rights abuses, funding terrorism, and destabilizing the region. Nothing about our overall approach to Iran has changed. We continue to pursue a strategy of deterrence, of pressure, and diplomacy. We remain committed to ensuring that Iran never acquires a nuclear weapon. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu released a statement focused on the country's main concern, Iran's nuclear ambition. Israel's position is known, according to which arrangements that do not dismantle Iran's nuclear infrastructure will not stop its nuclear program and will only provide it with funds that will go to terrorist elements sponsored by Iran. Certain international experts don't blame Israel for its stand on the Iranian deal. They're one of the lead funders of terrorism around the world, and they're a major opponent to key allies of ours like Israel and Saudi Arabia. Former U.S. Senator and Ambassador Sam Brownback tells CBN News he would understand any Israeli anger over the U.S. allowing billions of dollars to go to its erstwhile enemy. If I'm Israel, if I'm Saudi Arabia, I'm livid about this. Uh, and Israel's trying to limit Iran from getting a nuclear reactor and a nuclear weapon for obvious reasons. And this just helps fund those efforts. Richard Goldberg of the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies says the U.S. has clearly agreed to provide sanctions relief in return for almost nothing. Iran is not required to get rid of its enriched uranium stockpile. Iran is not required to dismantle a single centrifuge, shut down a single nuclear site. To the contrary, they continue to build up their nuclear capabilities under this arrangement, and they are building a secret underground site. Goldberg says that site would likely withstand a military strike and eventually help complete its nuclear weapons ambition. The Israelis are now faced with some pretty tough decisions of actions that they're going to need to take on their own without U.S. support. Could potentially have to destroy Iran's nuclear capabilities, especially that underground site that, if it's completed, would be game over from an attempt to stop an Iranian nuclear weapon. As the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism, Iran continues to focus on attacking Israel on all sides through Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad and Hamas. Not to mention all the threats that Iran poses to the state of Israel, the existence to Israel, their terror proxies that attack Israel every day. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thank you, Julie. Our CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief, Chris Mitchell, is here with us in studio. Chris, welcome to Virginia Beach. Great to always have you. Yeah, great to be uh, with here. you, George. I'm, I'm curious, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is blaming Iran um, in this recent surge of Palestinian terrorism uh, in recent days. How active is Tehran? in these activities. In it's a major factor in the West Bank, uh, George. Uh, they help fund and supply many of these uh, groups, especially the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, which is a Shiite group just like uh, Iran. Uh, 
Uh, and they're trying to destabilize the West Bank. It's all part of their overall strategy in the Middle East to really surround Israel with its proxies. Hezbollah on the north, Hamas on the south, mm -hmm. even down in Yemen with the Houthis. They, these are all uh, part of the proxy armies of Iran to surround Israel, and especially in the West Bank. They're funding and they're giving them supplies, they're giving them arms, and uh, it's clearly destabilizing that part of the West Bank. In addition to that, the Palestinian Authority is really leaving a vacuum in many of these areas like Janine and Nablus, and uh, that's why we're seeing a rise in terror attacks. And now many of the, uh, the groups in the West Bank, in Judea and Samaria, these mayors are saying the government needs to take a stronger stand against these terror groups. Yeah, all of this coming on the heels of this major announcement about this hostage deal. In fact, three uh, congressional Republicans are very concerned about the hostage deal that it's tied to a nuclear, quote-unquote, understanding between the White House and Iran. How are the Israelis responding to this? Well, they're, they're really uh, concerned, yeah. deeply concerned about what's happening. And, uh, you know, this is probably the biggest ransom in, in history for five Americans. And so what it does for Israel, it puts them in a bind. They need U.S. support for a potential nuclear uh, strike against Iran's nuclear program. Mm -hmm. uh, but what they're seeing is that they're, they're seeing a whole change in, in uh, policy from the Trump administration to the Biden administration. The Trump administration had this maximum pressure policy yeah. that really had Iran on the ropes financially, uh, diplomatically, and now Biden administration came in uh, not enforcing the sanctions that had been put in place and really having an appeasement policy mm -hmm. rather than a confrontational policy. Yeah, and obviously the White House saying, insisting that the $6 billion is going to towards humanitarian uh, efforts in the country. Uh, I, I'm curious, does this put more pressure on Jerusalem, on Tel Aviv, to potentially consider a military strike against Iran's nuclear facilities? Yeah, definitely. And if so, how feasible and what, what would be the impact of that? Well, uh, whether it's feasible or not has been a debate for yeah. many years. In fact, in 2012, there was a vote in the Israeli security cabinet whether or not they would attack mm -hmm. Iran's nuclear facilities. They obviously decided not to do so at the time. But as they see Iran getting closer and closer, and as they see the policy of the Biden administration that seems to allow Iran to go ahead and get a nuclear program, it's getting more and more dangerous for them. Mm -hmm. Netanyahu really has a sort of his uh, policy, I think it's a lifelong goal to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear uh, weapons, and I think they're doing what they can yeah. militarily to prepare for that, but they really need the U.S. support in some degree. Yeah, I wonder if uh, they're also watching the sort of political time frame in terms of the uh, presidential elections here to make a decision. Exactly. Chris, always great to have you here. Great to Welcome hear. back. Well, folks, turning now to the race for the White House, the first Republican primary debate is just hours away. While nine presidential candidates met the requirements to qualify, only eight will take the stage. Why? Well, after frontrunner Donald Trump announced he will not attend. CBN News White House correspondent Abigail Robertson brings us the story from Milwaukee. On stage will be Tim Scott, Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley, Vivek Ramaswamy, Chris Christie, Mike Pence, Doug Burgum, and Asa Hutchinson. Former President Trump chose to sit this one out. I like the debate. I mean, I probably am here because of debates. I don't mind it at all. But when you're 40 points up, but why would I let these people take shots at me? The latest Fox News poll has him leading the field with 53 percent. DeSantis is second at 16 percent. And political newcomer Ramaswamy is third at 11 percent. Since candidates are positioned according to their polling, that puts DeSantis and Ramaswamy at center stage. Thanks to you guys, I will be in the middle of that stage tomorrow to kick off the real season of this campaign. In an unusual move, the 38-year-old political newcomer held a welcome rally Tuesday night in Milwaukee. He's not afraid to speak what everybody's been thinking for a long time. Do you think he has a shot at being the GOP nominee? Yes, definitely. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. The RNC required all candidates to sign its Beat Biden pledge in order to be on stage, stating that they will support the eventual GOP nominee and will not participate in any debate not sanctioned by the group. Trump has not signed the pledge and currently has no plans to participate in future debates. Abigail Robertson, CBN News. A former President Trump will be making his views known as well. He recently did an interview with Tucker Carlson. 
And that discussion reportedly will be released tonight on X, formerly known as Twitter, around the same time as the debate. Coming up, a former ESPN anchor is speaking out about protecting women's sports from a transgender agenda. We'll hear what she says up next. Welcome back, folks. A free speech dispute between a veteran sportscaster and a major network. Disney-owned ESPN punished Sage Steele for an on-air criticism of company policy. Now she's parted ways with Disney and is free to speak her mind. As CBN's Brody Carter reports, she's standing up to protect women's sports from a transgender agenda. This case stems from Sage's 2021 comments on a popular podcast, where she voiced her disapproval of Disney's COVID vaccination policy. In response, the company forced Sage to apologize and took away high-profile assignments. So she sued Disney for violating her constitutional rights. To me, it is dangerous to remain silent on this. Sage Steele has been a pioneer female journalist at ESPN for nearly two decades. I have been part of empowering women, starting with myself in this man's world since I was a little girl, having this dream of being a sportscaster, um, but on every level professionally with women. Um, and I will never stop that. Recently, Steele and ESPN mutually agreed to part ways. Steele writing on Instagram, quote, having successfully settled my case with ESPN, Disney, I have decided to leave so I can exercise my First Amendment rights more freely. I am grateful for so many wonderful experiences over the past 16 years, and I'm excited for the next chapter. This is not new that men and women are different, and physiologically, <laughs> men are stronger than women. And that's just how it is. And that's okay. We're, God made us differently in many beautiful ways. During a recent interview with CBN, Sage announced she's using her platform to protect women's sports. Transgender women, biological men, do not belong competing in sports with women, period. To me, there's no black and white about this. It's actually ridiculous, in my opinion, that we're even having this conversation in our society today. Numbers from a Gallup poll show almost 70 percent of people agree that transgender athletes should only be allowed to compete on sports teams that corresponds with the sex they were assigned at birth. It also shows that more Americans consider changing one's gender to be morally wrong, which is up 4% since 2021. I understand the fear. I understand it because of what comes when you speak out. I am the poster child for what happens when you are true to yourself at times. And you know what? I'm okay with it now. Steele defended ESPN colleague Sam Ponder over bigotry claims when she tweeted it was unfair to ask young girls to compete against athletes who were male at birth. All these other women who are choosing to not use their platform for this, okay, I can't control that. And they all have that decision to make. I can control what I choose to do with my platform. And I'm telling you, this is a hill I'm willing to die on. I do find it fascinating <laughs> that it's only going one direction. It's biological men wanting to play sports with biological women. Why aren't biological women trying to go play sports with biological men? Why isn't it going the other way? Why? Well, because they can't. For the most part, we can't. And that's okay. Steele ended the interview saying sports is what brings people together. That while there's definitely a place for transgender biological male athletes, it's not in the arena with females. Brody Carter, CBN News. Still ahead, he is one of the most recognized actors in America with a career going back to the 1970s. Now Dennis Quaid has released a new gospel album and our Ephraim Graham talked with him about his music and his new film. We'll bring you their conversation right after this. Welcome back to CBN News Watch. Actor Dennis Quaid, he is known for a long roster of films, including The Parent Trap, I Can Only Imagine, and On a Wing and a Prayer. Now Quaid is flexing his music muscle with a new gospel album. It's called Fallen, a gospel record for sinners. Ephraim Graham sat down with Quaid to talk about his album and his role in a new film. You seen this? Major League Trials. You're going to paralyze him. 
I don't need you filling him full of false hope. He's my son. Dennis Quaid plays father and preacher James Hill in his newest film, The Hill. Ricky, baseball had to end eventually. Time to figure out what you're going to do with the rest of your life. So is this a story of faith, love, and second chances? Yes, it is. Seems to be a theme <laughs> in my life. And sometimes third and fourth and fifth. <laughs> I'm on my way up to heaven, so I can't be staying long. And it's a second chances story worth singing about in Quaid's new album. The, the album is called Fallen. Yes. A gospel record for, for sinners. Yes. Fallen, a gospel record for sinners. What gives birth a to A gospel this? record for sinners because I, I guess I wanted to have the widest possible audience I could have. Because we all. I, I, uh, <laughs> that's me, me first uh, with that. So many of us, uh, you know, out there that uh, feel disconnected, you know, you, you get out of uh, church or maybe you never experienced it. You feel disconnected from uh, their faith and that voice inside them. It's always accessible and it's always always there, no matter what you may have done, mm -hmm. what uh, or where you are in life, it's, there's always a way back home. Yeah. You grew up uh, in the Baptist church in yeah. Houston. Yeah. Uh, so since this is a return, if you will, what drew you back? You know, my story is I grew up at uh, in the Baptist church, first Baptist church in Bel Air. That's where I was uh, in Houston, Texas. That's where I was baptized. Wow. I was nine years old. And, uh, I, you know, I, we went to Sunday school and, you know, I'd sit in the pews for the service, you know, where you can't see everybody's head. <laughs> and I love the songs. I, I think I got started to get disillusioned with uh, church. You know, I at around 12, 13 years old. Oh, wow, that young. You know, it's teenage. Mm -hmm. uh, teenagers noticing the hypocrisy of, mm -hmm. of, of the world. My parents divorced as well. And uh, I guess, you know, I started to look elsewhere, of course. This is back in the 60s and 70s. And I was a seeker. I went, you know, and to fill that hole that is left that everybody has yeah. and tries to fill with so many things, whether it be, you know, it was with accomplishments, it was with sex or drugs or rock and roll or whatever it is, you know, that we all, I, you know, wanted to do it my way, I guess. And then uh, wound up getting involved with uh, cocaine. You know, it, it uh, Eventually, even though things looked fine on the outside, uh, it uh, they worked. And there was one night I had a band back then, and uh, we had a concert at the Palace Theater in Hollywood, and we got a record deal that night. And the band split up that night too because of me. I was just a mess, and. Um, I went home and I had one of those white light experiences. I had <clears throat> spent so many nights um, screaming at God mm. or begging God or whatever just to get some sleep before the next day or to take this away from me. And it, I just saw myself either dead in five years or in jail or losing everything that I had. And so I checked myself into rehab the next day. That's when I, I read the Bible again, cover to cover. I'd read it when I was 19, but I read it cover to cover. And but what really struck me were the red words of Jesus. And that was the beginning of having a personal relationship with God and a personal savior. I'd never gotten that before, what that was. My mother had told me, but I didn't really know. And I'm not saying it happened all at once. It's been a relationship that uh, is definitely real. It's sometimes stumbling on my part, but I, it's it's still there and it's been the rock of my life. And um, it's the joy of my life. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm 
I'm on my way. It's a spiritual journey, is, is what this record is. Yes. Would you like to come along? Come along. Come along, friend. Hey. Quaid's gospel album is called Fallen, a gospel record for sinners. It's available now wherever you purchase, stream, or download your music. And his film, The Hill, is out later this month. Studio 5 will have more on that on this week's show. Plus, Ephraim sits down with recording artist KB. He talks about his new album, His Glory Alone 2, and he digs deep into his book, Dangerous Jesus. And for all of this and much more uplifting entertainment, check out this week's all-new edition of Studio 5. You can catch it on the CBN News channel tonight at 8.30 Eastern. You can also watch it on the CBN News app or on YouTube. Coming up, a dangerous rescue at attempt in Pakistan as six children and two adults were trapped in a cable car over 1,100 feet above the ground. We'll show you what happened when we come back. Your news channel, your shows, the stories you care about. Anytime you want, anywhere you want. Download the CBN News app today. A daring rescue in Pakistan as military commandos brought down eight people who are trapped in a disabled cable car dangling high above a valley. The commandos returning them safely to the ground Tuesday after a daring and delicate operation. Six children between 11 and 15 years old and two adults were in a gondola for a trip to school when a cable snapped, bringing the car to a halt over 1,100 feet above a remote mountainous landscape. It took six hours for a helicopter to get there, but the copter couldn't fly after sunset. So rescuers, get this, eventually tried a risky operation using the remaining cable holding the car up. And they approached the car with an improvised chairlift. And slowly, all eight people were brought down. The drama, as you can imagine, transfixing the country for hours as Pakistanis crowded around the television in offices, shops, restaurants, and hospitals. Wow, it truly was an incredible rescue operation. Folks, that's it for this week's edition, this today's edition of CBN News Watch. Remember, you can find more of our news programs on the CBN News channel anytime or online with cbnnews.com. Also, tell us what you think about the stories you've seen by emailing newswatch at cbn.com. From all of us here, from the headquarters of the Christian Broadcasting Network, goodbye and God bless. <laughs>